Hey, welcome back to Minus Letter Live. My guests in this segment are returning for the second time. Hey, welcome back to Minus Letter Live. They throw this Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever day it is. Welcome back. Welcome back. We don't know what time it is. What day is it, Ed? It's Thursday. Thursday. Thursday all day long. Well, today we have a very special show because we have on our show joining us Mike Gorenstein from Kronos Group to talk about, among other things, the little uh, glitch shish kebab with uh, Andrew Left and Citron like, Research. I guess it's appropriately named Citron Research because if you read it and trade on it, you're going to trade a lemon. <laughs> uh, you know what? I don't think you can... You know, these things don't work necessarily instantaneously. I think, you know, like today, both of those issues are down dramatically. Oh, well, let's just see, looking at the cannabis large cap index as we are right now. The, uh, the sector's looking a little bit red. Like it's a little I, red. I, I don't, you know, I'm down not trying to blow my own horn here. Okay. But I did say yesterday, I kind of thought that, you know, we might have some some red uh, in the next few, in the next few days. I, you know, you, know, you get lucky once in a while. But I look. They Kronos group sold off seven point eight percent today. Which one? Kronos. Yeah. Well, look at uh, what about what about Tilray? You know, I've been doing some research on Tilray, and I think I understand why they're trading at an eight billion dollar valuation. Do you know why they're trading at an eight billion dollar valuation? Think of this, Novartis is behind them. Novartis has a $210 billion market cap. They could buy Constellation brand six times. Yeah. Novartis behind Tilray, which is what got some of the deepest pockets in Silicon Valley. I mean, I think what we're looking at here is the American front runner for global cannabis industry leader is definitely become Tilray. The Canadian leader, for global front runner of the Canadian of the cannabis industry globally is Canopy Growth. Canopy Growth. But if we were to look at Canopy Growth now with its partnership with Constellation, we would have to conclude that the impetus looks more oriented towards recreational brands and recreational lifestyle cannabis applications. Whereas with Novartis public publicly supporting Tilray there is an argument to be made for that is Tilray what did, what is... Did, where did the, the name Tilray come from? I don't see the connection. I can see, you know... Tilray. Um, I don't know the answer to that, Ed. I do believe I asked that question in a first interview with uh, yeah. Brendan Kennedy, but that would have been back in 2014, and I don't remember. So you could probably Google it on or search it on our website, and you might find that interview. You would definitely find that interview. Maybe Tilray is the name of some Greek... Uh, mytho mythological Tilray God Til Tilrayasus <laughs> Tilray Til Til Tilt a whirl Anyways, so we also have uh, Tim Proud joining us from uh, from Sokoman Gold Sokoman Iron Yeah, that's had a nice reversal today That's had a nice reversal and uh, then we also have uh who else did I have? Oh, and then we also have Deepak Anand and John Elkin from Can uh, Compliance Cannabis, yeah. Cannabis Compliance Inc. And those guys dropped a bit of a bombshell today. They did? They did. But you're not going to get to see that quite yet. We're going to start right now with Jeez, this. Jeez, you got me really all... I know. I got you all hot and bothered. You have my I? appetite whetted. Ooh, well... You're going to have to wait because right now we're going to talk to Tim Froud and ask him about this here thing going on out there in Newfoundland, don't you know? Uh, let's just start with a break, oh, shall we? Let's hey, welcome back to Midas Letter Live. My guest in this segment is Tim Froud. He's the CEO of Sokoman Iron Corp, trading on the TSX Venture under the symbol SIC. Tim, welcome back. Glad to be back, James. Tim, the, uh, uh, the project that you've launched a great drill program on now and has, I guess you're getting ready to launch phase two yes. and uh, you've had some tremendous results. Um, the, uh, 
the, the criticism that I've been receiving as, as a result of my enthusiastic accumulation of your stock at higher <laughs> levels is that, you Don't know. Don't put any pressure on me. No, well, exactly. Yeah. But uh, a, a lot of people were, you know, they're saying, well, wow, what's wrong with this company? I mean, the stock's fallen. And I said, there's nothing wrong with the company. It's doing exactly what mining companies do after a drill program that's yeah. had some success. The short-term scalpers have come in and made their money and now they're leaving to find wherever the next next sexy beast is. So that all being said, tell me, uh, I was also sort of disappointed in the reaction of the ultimate press release because it, it was, it didn't have an effect at all and anybody who would have juxtaposed that against the press releases previously mm -hmm. and from the previous results of Altius would understand that hey this is kind of a deposit that is starting to hang together in a lot of ways with lots yeah. of sort of discrete little opportunities within it yeah. and yeah. I guess that's why our venerable old friend down the street Mr. Eric Sprott was uh, excited enough to invest his own money in the deal and continues to be a supporting shareholder. Yeah I agree I mean I think you know the market was probably expecting more of, of hole one and I guess if that's a criticism you should never drill your best hole first I guess because it's always a tough act to follow but you know when, when we put that program together I mean we had a much smaller treasury James and mm -hmm. uh, you know I had a plan I had to test three particular uh, there were three objectives I wanted to uh, you know uh, see through uh, with the first phase one was to put one hole and one hole only into the eastern trend. The rest were to go towards the western trend where there were numerous uh, um, unexplained, not unexplained, but uh, open-ended intercepts and, and, uh, and room actually to expand on the, resu on the, uh, on the uh, results of uh, you know, the previous operator. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we stuck to the plan. I mean, I didn't know, you know what was eventually going to happen in the following weeks in terms of you know, uh, money's coming in and stuff. Uh, but no, I mean, now that we're ready to go to phase two, obviously focus, you know, pri you know, priority one is going back to the area of around whole 1801 for sure. So the eastern zone that yielded the 12 meters of 44.96 grams per ton is going to be the principal focus of the next drill program starting in the first week of October. That's correct. Yeah, we uh, we'll we'll have we'll have we have permits for one drill right now, and because we expanded the program, it required a, a, a juggling of uh, of the uh, of the permitting process. Mm -hmm. So we're currently waiting for the permits for the second rig, but we're on schedule to put the first rig on on, on site and and test testing around hole 1801 uh, sometime in very early October for sure. Sure. So how many holes are you going to drill in phase two? Well, I've budgeted uh, uh, for 10,000 meters, okay. and I guess the ultimate number of holes will obviously depend on the depth and, mm -hmm. and number of holes. And I mean, you know, if we, if we continue with success at, uh, in the 1801 area, I mean, we're just going to continue to drill holes there, right? So the exact number of holes is, is going to be difficult to, to predict, but I, I would suspect we're going to be drilling at least 40 or 50 holes, you know, mm -hmm. in total, right? So right. that's for the program, right? Sure. Um, the other properties that you have in the portfolio are no, no slouches either, which I was pleased to learn yesterday when I was at the presentation. Well, yeah, I, I'm particularly fond of Clark's Brook, which is actually, uh, if you go immediately uh, to the right or east of this, of this photograph, uh, mm -hmm. you'll, uh, about 20, 20, 20 miles distant is our Clark's Brook project, which okay. we drilled for the first time. Um, not just we, but the first holes drilled on the property were actually in the fall of 2017. And basically we were following up on some historical um, uh, float and um, there, there was very poor outcrop again. Yeah, that's the one. You see the cluster of large boulders there. Well, they ran up to 24 grams per ton, right? Okay. And, but it was never drilled. And um, we decided to take that project on in lieu of trenching on some of our earlier stage projects because we figured we get a bigger bang for our buck by drilling a hole rather than digging a trench mm -hmm. sort of thing. And uh, we, we drilled seven holes, and, and all holes hit mineralization. And I just want to draw your attention to the northernmost hole there, which has the most uh, uh, widespread mineralization. Um, overall, you know, the grades are, are modest, you know, gram over 13 meters. But we do get up uh, to, we actually got VG in that hole as well, you know, mm. over, a, over a very narrow interval. But uh, it's a different system, James, than the Moosehead stuff. Um, in, in, my, in my opinion, we're actually looking at the top of an epithermal type system here. Okay. Moosehead would be more of an orogenic, deeper seeded sort of uh, roots of that system. I think what we're looking at here is the top of an epithermal system. And I'm, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we step back and, and drill the hole down through the, the blue colored uh, uh, areas there. Mm -hmm. Those are magnetic low targets. 
And if you look, most, if not all, of our drill intersections are actually on or within, you know, or very in, in close proximity to the, uh, to the mag low. I like our chances here of, of just drilling down into the system sure. to see what, uh, what's at depth. Because if we're looking at the top uh, of a gold mineralized epithermal system, you know, you know, I'd like to think that at, at some reasonable depth, we could be getting down into potentially bonanza grades, or certainly higher grades, right? Wow. And as well, down at the bottom of the slide there, you can see where that, that blue color wraps around there. Yeah. I, you know, that's probably a fold, and fold hinges are very good places, you know, for thickening and, and improving grades of mineralization. So, uh, you know, it, it, won't be, it won't be a distraction for us, but right. it's certainly a project that we could, you know, certainly, you know. Are you going to drill some at phase two uh, in here? Uh, well, if, 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 you know, if, if Moosehead allows us, okay. <laughs> right, because it, it's still our control, it, it's still our flagship property. How right? far is this from Moosehead? Well, in a straight line, it's about 30 kilometers, about 20 miles, uh, but to drive to it, uh, it's, it's probably an hour's drive. But again, on, on very well used roads, uh, you can park a, a pickup truck, you know, within, you know, 100 meters of these collars. So, I mean, uh, again, n not, a, not a difficult project to access or, or work at all. Oh, that's great. Yep. Uh, and then you've got also the Iron Horse Project. This was actually the namesake of the company originally, wasn't it? Yeah, well, we started life as a gold company, and then when the iron ore market took off uh, uh, six or seven years ago, we decided to take a, take a shot, and we actually acquired a property in, the, in an underexplored part of the trough because there wasn't any room left in the, in the established parts, you know, where the producing mines are in Labrador. Mm -hmm. So we acquired, we got this project and, and drilled, uh, actually these are the only holes drilled on uh, in this area area and uh, we were quite pleased to discover uh, you know very significant mineralization including you know up to 354 meters of uh, of just about 28 percent now it's obviously taconite it's not the DSO or the, right. or the jewel of the iron ore business but uh, you know uh, there's probably you know a very significant tonnage of, of iron ore here that just needs to be drilled off and uh, you know uh, it's in good standing it's not costing us anything to hold it and as well so areas to the south of where we've drilled for iron ore we're also seeing um, um, interesting levels of uh, uranium and uh, rare earth metals as well. So oh. uh, <laughs> one, of these, one of these projects where you pick a commodity sort of thing. You know, sure, an embarrassment of, of riches. <laughs> I like those ones. But uh, anyway, it's like I said, uh, it's still in our portfolio. And uh, you know, well, if we can monetize it or move it at some point, uh, sure. we certainly will. Okay, so then uh, the focus remains the gold project at Moosehead. Yep. Okay, yes. excellent. All right, and so with uh, the drill program starting in October, first results probably by the uh, beginning of November-ish? Uh, that might be a bit soon, right? Okay. It, it all depends. I mean, uh, it's always hard to predict these things, and I guess uh, a lot of it will depend on probably what we get as well, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if, we, if we end up, you know, with a bunch of holes like 1801, I mean, uh, I don't think anyone would be very happy if we sat on those for a while. So, uh, you know, we'll probably release results periodically, but just the timetable might be difficult to, uh, to, to, to pin down right now. Sure. All right. Well, that's a great update, Tim. We're going to continue to follow with interest. Thanks very much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me again, James. We're back. Yeah. So, what do you think? You a buyer of Sokolman? Well, somebody is. Uh, it stocks up a nickel today or something like that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he was presenting to Eric Sprott this morning, he was telling me. And uh, he did that presentation yesterday at the Linya restaurant, yeah. which was pretty well received, pretty yeah. well attended. A lot of good food uh, uh, was brought out after most people left. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Oh, I guess, <laughs> I, guess you I left. Were, you were one of the most people. <laughs> I suppose I was. Yeah, well, oh. I'll tell you. Yeah, they brought out some nice sliders. Oh, really? And some nice cheese balls. Cheese balls? Well, they didn't even look like cheese balls. That's how nice they were. Wow. I thought cheese balls looked nice when they were just looking like cheese Maybe balls. Maybe they were cheese whiz balls. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This is the food and beverage portion of oh, our okay. show. Yeah, moving right along. Yeah, anyways, uh, so Ed, uh, you got anything smart to say for me today? Yeah. Yeah? What do you got? Well, like, what's, what's, give me a tradable idea. Well, you know, I, I got to say that, I got to say that. Uh, uh, Time's up. <laughs> eh. No tradable ideas? Well, I was just about to tell you what some of those tradable ideas okay. were. Okay, what is no, that? I, I got to say that. Uh, we have a guest here from Sweden today, Max PT27. Hello, Max from Sweden. Hey, Max. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? 
Oh, come on in. I love your Swedish accent. Yeah, <laughs> that's my Swedish accent. You have all. Yeah. Um, Tilray sold off today. Tilray. I've got it, the chart up. I got the five-day yeah. uh, chart up here. If you put up a ten, put up a tenor. Er, er, that's that's a. <laughs> that was me. Put up a, a smiling a, goofily. Put up a daily chart. I want to point this something. Is a out. This is the ten-day chart. Yeah. Put up a one one, uh, one, a year? one month. One month. Yeah. That's all we need. Okay. There you go. You see that that the the range. Th this is the biggest ranging day. On this chart, the biggest ranging day is yesterday. Yeah. That 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 range is greater than the issue price of the stock. I think the stock was issued at seventeen. Yep. This was a twenty-five dollar range. Now, usually, usually trends tend to end, or, uh, and I'm not saying trends up or or trends down when there's a violent swing. And we had a violent swing yesterday. Twenty-five dollars. Twenty-five dollars is more than what, what? Why was this a reasonable price? A month ago, and now, you know, we're talking. I, I know, I know. They're backed by Novartis and other big swinging. Well, when you say backed by Novartis, what does that mean? Is it their shareholders? But how big? I don't know. Did they have to pay to get in? Yes. How what? much? Can't tell you that. Can't tell you that. No. Well, there's no question that adds some value to it, but. You know, this thing, and we also pointed out at some point that the RSI was up to 88. Yeah. So this... That's this down may, to 76. This, look, there's a trend here that may be, you know, it's still early to tell, but I'd say this, this could have a, a wicked correction and still be a buy. I mean, we saw it, we saw it correct uh, dramatically when it came out. It ran up to about 30 bucks, back to 20, and then... Like a like a rocket ship up to ninety seven dollars. So look 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 where the lower band is on this thing. Do you know where it is? Seven. Yeah. Seven. So so the gap between the high high upper band and lower band is about eighty some seventy some points. And and we know the, these bands go from very wide to narrow. Mm -hmm. Very wide to narrow. So I, you know, and I, I, I'm not saying it's over for Tilray, but it may be over for a little while. A breather. Okay. So that, that's something that. Let's to look keep at weed mind. then. Now, look, that look, looks look just at, like the Tilray chart. Well, to, to some degree, but the, the bands, I mean, the spread isn't as big, but this is a much, you know, there's a lot more shares. But, uh, you know, I, I would tend to think that the, 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 the spread between the, the, high, the upper band and the lower band is going to narrow here. What was that noise? Is that camera making that noise? Oh. <laughs> Got a card sharp in the background. Uh, yeah. So what do you think, Ed? Are we, it's a down day today. Sell off, yes, sell off again yesterday. And, and, and Is this look the at reversal? Yesterday, look at yesterday. We had the biggest volume, one day volume, it looks like. Yeah. In quite a while, ever since. In fact, that volume yesterday looks to be a little bit more than the volume we had the day they made the announcement, which is here. Just going to point it out to the viewers. That's just about the same, but yet, no, no, no more news. But it just may be the climax, a bit of a climax. So let's we we just got to watch this carefully. But you know, there's been some damage done here. Uh, a lot of people uh, got in yesterday. They're offside. Yeah. So this whole market phenomenon, we could see it correct right back to where it started, couldn't we? Abs Listen, you know, the one thing you learn after watching this stuff for 40 years, anything can happen. You know, it's just a sign. Can't go to zero. Like, let's say, like, you've been hearing of the trouble that Donald Trump's been having this week. You know, I really, I really haven't. Oh, really? Well, so, first of all, Bob Woodward the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist behind Watergate, put out a book that wherein he's quoting people like uh, um, Rex Tillinger and you know the, the top guys in Trump's administration calling him an idiot and a fifth grader and he knows nothing. So that's pretty bad. Then there's an anonymous op-ed published in the New York Times yesterday 
where somebody from inside the administration is actually talking about how there's a group of them around the president who are doing things like stealing papers off of his desk that they're afraid he might see and sign. And so they're just taking them and hiding them on him so that he doesn't even see them because they know that if he sees them, he'll, you know, he'll move it forward. In the <laughs> so basically, his own team is now running around <laughs> undermining his presidency in an effort to protect the country. And they call themselves the resistance. <laughs> So, for example, if something were to happen like along the lines of a constitutional crisis, so the 25th Amendment has been brought up as a method potentially for removing the president, the 25th Amendment meaning we can take out the president if he's lost his marbles and is unfit for government as a result. So if something like that was to happen and throw the whole financial market into a state of panic, could the cannabis stocks go to nothing? You know, n nothing's. You said I, I anything could happen, so well, I'm just testing I, I, the boundaries. I, 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 I what would you mean ascribe, by that? I would ascribe the probability of it going to nothing at less than one tenth of one tenth of one tenth of one percent. Point zero zero zero. Like it's some infinitesimally small percentage, but anything can happen. Like you know, be, and if you say nothing, like, let's let's say for instance, a meteor appears up in, in uh, somewhere and it's heading for the Earth. Everything's going to nothing, right? Or the well, sun burnt out. The sun burnt out. We'll just start a new one. Start a new sun? Yeah. How do we do that? I don't know. Fusion? Fishing. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I don't mind going fishing. <laughs> no, I, I get your point. I get your point. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, but, so... But what are the odds? Very remote. So, yeah. so it's the same with this, right? That's why those bands are hel so helpful, because they basically say that 95 or 98% of the time, the price is going to trade within so many standard deviations of a moving average. Right. That's why there's a moving average within those bands. So, yeah, they, they go, sort of go up and down. But then when things get really bubbly, they break out of there and you say, oh, my God, look at this. It's way over outside the band. Well, but it doesn't happen very often. So, you know, it's going to come back with inside. Right. That's why most of the time they're within those bands. That's the whole purpose. Hmm. When they get out, change your tack, like, especially if you're a trader, right? Right. Like, let's punch up Afria today because I see it was one of the uh, one of the marijuana companies, the one of the bigger saw, ones. We saw Vic Newfeld in the elevator, and he didn't he didn't even deign to stop by for a visit today, which is a bit yeah. odd. Vic, Vic, Vic. Is he is he maybe the great Dane? <laughs> look look at this now. So look at maybe he just didn't feel like talking. Even today. though it, it's had a big move, it's only slightly above, but it's nowhere near where it was. Put it up the uh, one year chart, please, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Of course, sir. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. No, sir. Okay, okay. still trading on the outer edge of the Bollinger Band. It's, it's riding that band, yeah, riding that band. And that's, 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 that's fine. With Let's, the RSI above 80. What does that tell us? Getting the time to get a little short. gun shy. Yeah. You don't have to short. You can sell your position and then re get back in after there's been a correction. And it's hmm. the same difference. I don't have a position. Well, you do have a position. You Not in Afria. Yeah, but I didn't say you had a position in Afria. I said you had a position. Oh, well, I have a position. It's not you a good position. You have a perspective. I have a perspective. Yeah. I, my perspective is that this thing's going to end very badly. But when? The key is when. There's going to be lots of opportunity on the downside. You, There's going to be you know, lots of opportunity in the upside for the survivors. Look at this. This thing's up nine percent today. Look, it's at twenty twenty-two. This is this is picking up steam. Yeah. This may be the next deal. Now, Vix. This is Vix. Uh, Vix the CEO. Correct? Yes, correct. Maybe he's inking a deal right now in this building. Well, we did see him earlier. Yeah, on I the... saw him. I saw him. Who else is on that floor? What floor was it? Yeah. What floor was it? Well, well it, was I don't in, know. it was. It was a floor that was in the floor of the f uh, bank of floors that your elevators get to this floor. Okay, so, so he's, he's close by. You, you don't know what floor he got on? It? He got on the ground floor. He got on the ground floor? Yeah. What floor did he get off on? I don't know, I didn't, I should have jumped on with him. It's hey, where are you, you going? You should have. Darn Ed. Opportunity blown. There we go. And, look, 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 and, and you know, we, we commented regularly two weeks ago saying, you know, Afria's really not participating in this thing.
No. And we, we should have been saying, you know what, it's just going to be a matter of time before Afria participates. Because look. Yeah. I think we did say that. I think we did. We kind of intimated We alluded that, yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we like to cover all bases. So but, we, but again, I mean, look, you got the, the, when the bands widen out, they're, they're going to, at some point, they're going to come back in. Snap back. Snap back. Look at the volume here since uh, August 23rd. Yeah. Look at, look at those major days. Something's changed. And, and there's got to be other, there's got to be tobacco companies. There's got to be pharma companies. I mean, people are looking at the success of Constellation brands. And, yep. and, and what was the big uh, company in the U.S. that's uh, involved with Tilray? Novartis. Novartis. They're no slouch. No, they're a $210 billion company. If you, if you were to consider a Tilray in the same, Tilray's relationship with Novartis in the same context as Canopy Growth's relationship with uh, Constellation. Right, right. One could make the case that the Tilray deal is a much bigger deal, and that is why it's trading at an eight billion dollar market yeah. cap, because the the biggest yeah. days are yet ahead. You look at the biggest companies in any sector in the U.S. They're not trading at within you know under a hundred bucks. They're trading in multiples hundreds of dollars. So I mean, is did you know that Amazon got to two thousand and fifty bucks per share? Two thousand and fifty bucks. I think in, in two thousand and four, after the dot com thing blew up, it was trading at seven bucks. Seven dollars to two thousand and fifty. That's a big win. Why did you buy any of that? Don't even don't even get me going. I was suggesting that the company was going under. Mm. Well, there was a time when uh, the company that I was running called Elgrande.com was considered a contender for market share with Amazon. We had a similar business model. Mind you, that's going back 20 years. So yeah, uh, 14 anyway. Yeah, 14 years. Uh, yeah. That was 98 actually. No, it was 20 years. 98 when we were rolled out the El Grande business model. Anyways, um, let's take a look at some of the uh, the indis indices here. Let's start with a large one. Okay, so who's the big winner on the large one as of now? Let's reload this. Look at that, MedMan. Oh, there it was. MedMen up 13.2% today after dropping almost yesterday, the same amount yesterday. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's volatile. Now, that's not quite, I think it was down a buck, 90 cents yesterday or something. And today it's up. So it's interesting to note, too, sometimes when you see these big swings, like the, the, the one swing is a little bit less. And, and yesterday we had a bigger down day than we have an up day. But yeah. Look at this, and look at Hexo here, new highs. Yeah, 647. Don't know why that one's trading Lotto like that. 6, is that like 647 or 649? <laughs> and in the small caps, Namaste Technologies. The small caps, you got here. You got a big one here, huge up a penny. Yeah. Not, not, to be, not, not to be facetious, but look, these small caps are really you, you, you get the sense it's bigger companies, bigger institutions coming in, picking their spots. Well, actually, actually, Namaste is now, if it keeps this valuation, it's now valued at $750 million. So technically, this goes in the large cap index as soon as, let's see, wow. Q4 starts uh, October 1st. So at the end of September, if this thing's above $500 million, Namaste will be in the large cap list and will come out of the small cap list. That's interesting. Huh. And our old friends at Supreme are just squeaking into the small cap, or the large cap index at 501 million. But everything seems to be selling off mostly in the small cap space, except Huge has added a penny today. Uh, that's, that's neither here nor there. But, uh, you know, everything's a bit selling off. Let's see what the big gainers are in the Okay, Liberty Health Sciences is up seven cents to a buck today. Yeah. Liberty Health is that's uh, that's a free just announced that they divested themselves of their final holding in Liberty Health Sciences. Yet they retain the ability to control up to forty percent of the company through a warrant exercise at some point here, which is interesting. Uh, so let's see. That's the big ones. Those are the big ones in the small caps. 
Among the venture listed, well, organogram, 811 million. 650 still still generally tacking on new value, still riding the wave. <coughs> Emerald, Emerald Health, Health, yeah. 444. Yeah, that's uh, less than half of its peak. Yeah. Weed MD. I know there's something going on down at uh, one of my friends uh, is, is, a, is a pretty big follower of Weed MD. He's telling me there was some, something he was uh, attending. Uh, you know, I should have read it more carefully, but it was some kind of harvest. Oh, their first harvest, yeah, that big party's going on. You know, getting back to Afria, uh, Afria had the deal with Shoppers Drug Mart, right? Yes. And Shoppers Drug Mart, uh, rumor has it, is uh, going to be joining a lawsuit. Um, there's a lawsuit going on in BC right now, and uh, we had Deepak Anand and uh, John Elkin here, for, sorry, Michael, Michael Elkin here from uh, Cannabis Compliance Inc. And they had some very interesting things to say about the onset of legal in October. And here's what they Oh, had they're gonna to say it to the, to the viewers? We're gonna have them on right now. Oh, this ought to be very interesting. Elkin is Director of Strategic Sales for Cannabis Compliance, Inc. Gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you, James. You guys always have the ear to the ground and what's going on behind the scenes, and today is no different. I'd like to open a, the discussion with the idea that there is a lawsuit wending its way through the Supreme Court of British Columbia, or is it Federal Supreme Court? Supreme Court of BC. Supreme Court of BC, whereby a group of dispensaries have engaged uh, Messrs. Conroy and Tusa, who were the successful challengers in the MMAR constitutional challenge back in March 2013. Something like yeah. that, I believe. And the dispensaries are challenging the government's right to shut down their dispensaries and stop them from providing medical cannabis to medical patients because they feel they have a constitutional right to do so? So James, uh, the story is that the city of Vancouver actually has an injunction to shut some of the dispensaries down in Vancouver that have not paid a lot of municipal licensing fees. Mm. Uh, John Conroy, Clark Tussaud is not involved in this file oh. anymore because he's been hired by Canopy Growth, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, but so John Conroy is representing dispensaries in this, in this sort of charter issue that's being brought forward. It's actually uh, an injunction filed by the city of Vancouver to shut dispensaries down. What John Conroy has argued uh, this week, it was the first hearing in the Supreme Court, uh, was that the city of Vancouver is aiding and abetting essentially an illegal activity. Um, and he's arguing that the dispensary should remain open because they're providing medical cannabis access to patients. Uh, and so they've, they've, they've sort of counterfiled sort of a suit saying uh, that they're going to take the provincial government in BC as well as the federal government to court, uh, demanding to remain open uh, because they're providing medical access to patients in BC. Hmm. Looking, <clears throat> looking for a loophole. Yeah, okay, so it sounds to me like the uh, dispensaries could, if successful, be a legal outlet for medical, medical cannabis, cannabis across the country. Well, certainly, I mean, this, that, so basically what's being tried here, and I think there's a ruling coming down, is determining now the constitutionality of the ACMPR. It's one of sort of the line items that the judge is going to rule in the next four weeks once these hearings are complete. Uh, I mean, arguably at that time we'll be getting into Cannabis Act territory, so we don't know exactly how this will unfold, but arguably if the ACMPR is deemed unconstitutional, uh, then there will be an avenue for dispensaries to remain open for medical purposes. Hmm. It all gets so confusing, especially since the Canadian Medical Association is also lobbying for an extension or a preservation of their dominion over, Health Canada's dominion over the medical side, while others are saying that there's no need for ACMPR once the medical rules take effect. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm so confused. Yeah. 
there's certainly a, a great deal of confusion on this issue. I mean, uh, the CMA has never sort of wanted to be involved on this file. You know, very early on uh, when the MMPR was being drafted, pharmacists were the ones that were going to be the gatekeepers for, their, for this drug. And very quickly they said, you know, they didn't want part of it. And sure enough, now we've come full circle where uh, we've got pharmacy chains that are very interested in, in getting into this space. We've got the Canadian Pharmacists Association saying, hey, we want to start getting involved in dispensing this drug. So, you know, I think it's a matter of time before we'll see the CMA come full circle, but they're certainly not there yet. Hmm. Wow. So it sounds like October 17th is yet fraught with certain peril yeah. in terms of the certainty of who can and who can't legally sell it. And whoever is excluded from that has, is, has got avenues to pursue legally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And then you add to that another layer of complexity is the whole home grow element where you've got provinces like Quebec and Manitoba saying no, absolutely zero plants, you can't grow up to four plants, uh, which again is, is the Minister of Health said, defeating, or Minister of Justice said, uh, defeating the federal purpose. Um, right. So that, that's going to be tried out in court. So how can, I mean, I'm just thinking, if I'm an individual in Manitoba and I say no pr province of Manitoba, the feds say I can, so I will and I am, and then the provincial police kick down their door and steal your plants and then you challenge them in federal court and the feds say this case is dismissed because we've said it's I mean it's a just a it's just a it's a dog's breakfast really is what it is absolutely and there's paramount to see laws that sort of come in in terms of do the feds have say on this or do the provinces I know that the justice minister federally said it's defeating or frustrating the federal purpose so mm -hmm. I mean we're gonna see a lot of this stuff play out through the court streams and then how does it domino from whatever court decision comes down and then sure. what other provinces pick up on that and yeah so it's gonna be pretty interesting just to see how that plays out in, in BC and then how it dominoes through the country. So. Sure, so from where you guys sit and from what you're seeing, we've got probably a thousand illegal dispensaries across the country. Minimum. Minimum. I look on weed maps and there's a hundred companies that yeah. will deliver me a bag of dope for 90 bucks yeah. in one hour or less. Yeah. And those dispensaries are saying that they will defy the law and will stay in business. So I'm looking at these constitutional challenges arising and I'm looking at these dispensary operators and I mean it doesn't s seem to me that the government has a lot of solid ground around their legal basis differentiating who can and who cannot supply cannabis yeah. to the public. I think what the federal government has done well is, through the Cannabis Act, address issues of non-medical cannabis. Uh, I certainly differentiate the two between medical and non-medical cannabis. I think the Cannabis Act does a good job addressing sort of non-cannabis, sort of non-medical cannabis or recreational cannabis. Uh, administration, possession, cultivation addresses all of those challenges. Uh, James has a bill called Bill C-46 that deals with criminal penalties. Uh, 45 is the Cannabis Act, 46 deals with criminal penalties for people working outside the system. Then you've got provincial bills layered on top of that that have further criminal provisions for people working outside the system. So I think if you keep the medical issue aside for a second, uh, people that are operating non-medical cannabis dispensaries are, 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 are on sort of very shaky territory if they remain open post-legalization because they are a number of things that provinces and the federal government have built in mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. they will start to enforce that. Okay, when are they going to start enforcing them? I have, uh, I walk by two dispensaries on my way to work every day, and they're just doing a booming business. It's all cash. They don't even seem to be, in fact, it was, it, it, the, it was the height of, of irony to me that I was walking home, and they were shooting a movie, and there were two cops standing in front of the dispensary, oh, nice. making sure nobody parked in front of the dispensary who was working for the movie, which right. is who the cops were working for. And, you know, it was like the cops aren't doing anything about the dispensary. They're more concerned about the traffic on behalf of the movie, yeah. which to me is like, well, what's going on here? I, I think uh, just drawing a parallel to California right now, what's going on is that they they have gotten into their uh, legal framework where they're uh, stopping the temporary license. They're moving to a permanent annual license. They've started to send out cease and desist letters to cultivators, to retail uh, legal retail uh, storefronts. So I think it's once the regulator has a... a somewhat of a solid uh, foundation is when they're going to start enforcing because I think right now until the Cannabis Act comes into enforcement it's still that gray area right now right where you're, you're telling illegal dispensaries if you comply then there is a window for you to get in so for, coming from the opposite side of the uh, of the fence here I think um, it's just a waiting period till till we can get some 
some more foundation under under Health Canada and the Cannabis Act? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Do and we I have the resources to go out and, and shut these shops down now? I mean, that's another question. Yeah, I mean, the Cannabis Act does give a lot of power to policing authorities to be able to go after enforcement. But I mean, even the provincial government get, gets involved. I mean, you heard the Attorney General in Ontario uh, when they were announcing sort of their path to the retail monopoly, say if you're operating in the illegal dispensary. Stop. Stop was the word. Uh, and in BC, we've, you know, we've got a cannabis czar that's going to go and start to enforce these like, regulations. So, hmm. uh, you know, I, there's certainly some charter issues aside on the medical stuff, but certainly on non-medical we will certainly see enforcement step up. Where I think this gets a little bit more challenging is not the bricks and mortar dispensaries, it's actually, James, the online dispensaries. I think those are the ones that are going to be a lot more challenging to shut down because they're operating offshore with domain and credit card processors that aren't within control of the government of Canada. So I think that gets a lot more challenging. Well, exactly, and fulfilled through the mail. You, who knows where it yeah. came from? Who knows where the source of it is? So that's, that's just it. The, you know, if you look back at the laws that were su challenged successfully on constitutional grounds, I mean, really the whole access to cannabis for medical purposes was originated as a result of patients challenging the federal government yeah. for their right to access the medicine that they felt helped them in right. 2002, I guess was the original MMAR. Yeah. And, and so it's the, the pattern is that constitutionally, People have generally succeeded against the government where their rights were infringed for accessing cannabis for medical reasons to this point, but now we're going into the recreational, recreational era. era. Why should it be any different that, like, why should it be criminal for recreational use if it's not criminal for recreational use if it, uh, as long as it's from a certain source? It's, it's, it strikes me that you, there's... It's, going to be very difficult to resolve that conflict where just because it's a government sanctioned source that pays right. taxes to the government and this source doesn't pay taxes to the government and therefore is illegal, I think constitutionally you're going to have a hard time incarcerating people and depriving them of their freedom on constitutional grounds. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you know, you have to look at one of the basic tenets of legalization is we're proceeding with this from a public health and a public safety approach. Um, and that's sort of the, 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 the government's sort of objective on going about this. has been, uh, we want to make sure that anything that's being controlled is safely produced, is well regulated. I mean, arguably, they, you, you know, you don't know what product is out there currently, whether it be in an online dispensary or a bricks and mortar dispensary, because some of it's being tested, others aren't. I mean, the whole objective here is we're protecting public health and public safety uh, by strictly controlling access and I think that's what our clients that are licensed producers do very well uh, is certainly comply with those regulations from a safety efficacy and quality control perspective mm -hmm. uh, and then when you add another layer to this James there are UN treaties that we are signatory to that control sort of how we can go about dealing with this controlled substance even post October 17th we will be in violation of UN treaties but there are still things that you need to legislate from a federal government perspective that you know, you can't have yeah, if this is going to be sort of open to anybody growing it uh, wherever. Hmm. Incredible. So where do you see the court case ending up in BC? Like what is just, what's your gut feeling as to the direction that thing's going to go? Well, I think the, 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 the charter issue on medical access is a strong one. Uh, you know, I've had a chance to review some of the court filings, and I can say there's some very strong affidavits being made around uh, access being impeded through licensed producers. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens and when that ACMPR, whether it's sort of deemed constitutional or not, uh, and then the Cannabis Act takes in. So, I mean, there's certainly a lot of interesting things coming up. And, I mean, clearly, uh, if the, I was the federal government, I would be looking at enabling pharmacies access because uh, that addresses the issue of compliance and all the other things but uh, you know I'm sure those conversations are happening in Ottawa now. Hmm. Interesting. One of the things I've noticed to, just to take it a bit of a d different direction now is that Health Canada only lice issued one ACMPR license in all of August. A new ACMPR I mean. New ACMPR licenses. Only two in July. Uh, it, about six in June. Right. So has, I mean, if, if just looking at the way it's sort of dried up, has, has there been a sort of informal moratorium place on future ACMPR licenses at this point? 
Uh, Health Canada is certainly going down the path. I mean, we've seen a lot of clients getting RFIs, which is requests for information. Uh, I mean, I don't think that it's been stalled or there's a moratorium being placed. I certainly think resources are being shifted and, and sort of adjusted within the department to cater towards the Cannabis Act and all of the different licenses that are coming on board. I mean, Health Canada is doing a phenomenal job of transitioning people that are both applicants and licensed producers into the CTLS, which yeah. is the Cannabis Tracking and Licensing System. I mean, they've been busy over the whole summer doing tutorials to both applicants and LPs to transition into that uh, category. So I think momentarily you may see uh, sort of uh, fewer licenses being handed out, but that's because they're preparing to get into the new regulated system. Yeah, there's a massive migration coming, right? We're going to go from one program to a completely other program, and then there's going to be people that are going to be caught in limbo. So just keep taking care of those people that have you know, work their way through the queue and answering their RFIs, uh, keeping up their file has to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then um, the uh, who's going to administer the the recreational licenses? It'll still be Health so Canada. So Health Canada has formed something called the Cannabis Legalization and Regulation Branch uh -huh. that's going to oversee all 10 categories of licenses that are available under the Cannabis Act. Wow. Uh, previously it was called the Office of Medical Cannabis and then so now it's called CLRB which is the Cannabis Legalization Regulation Branch. Okay, sounds really interesting. We're going to leave it there for now guys. Thanks again for your participation. We'll come back to you soon. Thanks James. Okay, okay so then um, the... Well, what do you uh, think Ed? It's going to cause some problems, don't you? Think so? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got to think about this sentence a little bit. <laughs> Let's put it all together. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah, well, look, look, there's going to be lots of problems, right? Yeah. A guy, a guy said to me today, he said, you know, we should just, they should just let the, the, the crim, criminal element carry on. They've done a great job so far. <laughs> like, That's you, true, we have. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, we're in, we're in uh, uncharted waters here. Like, we're in. The, we're down the rabbit hole. Yeah, we're well and truly down the rabbit hole. So this is going to cause a lot of concern, and there's only so much money involved. I think a lot of the real opportunity is going to be internationally, and I think that's what you know. Uh, you know, Mike, brands Mike Gorenstein. Uh, is is here and we're going to talk to him in about 25 minutes okay uh and he tells me well so they put out a press release today about this new deal with this company ginkgo which has raised over 400 million dollars has some really big crazy agri agricultural names from and basically what these guys do is they uh they create cannabinoids through a biosynthetic process that does not involve plants. So essentially what they're doing is they are synthesizing the molecules right. through various DNA. Yeah. Uh, on, we did a, something with this gentleman already, right? No. That was somebody else? So this is the thing. So Organogram is doing it with genetically modified yeast through their subsidiary Hyacinth. Hyacinth is going to be here next week. And hyacinth does the same thing. It generates cannabinoids from genetically modified yeasts. So, you know, now you've got Kronos Group with this similar technology, maybe arriving at it in a different way. But the implications of that for the global built out supply of greenhouses and greenhouse grown marijuana, it implies that we're already so oversupplied in terms of our ability to grow cannabis. Because think of it, the only portion of the market for cannabinoids that does not need to be supplied, that can't be supplied by these alternative biosynthetic sources is the craft, premium, dried flower, purist, smoke, which is what? Maybe 10% of the audience? Maybe 20% if you're generous? But that means that 80% of the Is that like gummies, Ellen, Ellen generous? Ellen DeGeneres. The gummies, the beers, the you know, the cookies, edibles. the candies, all the edibles, all of Chocolates. the drinks, all of the medicines. The, that cannabis isn't going to come from expensive greenhouse grown ultra come, come high from tech laboratory. They're going to come from a laboratory environment where it's grown at sub one penny per unit of input. One penny. There was no margin in a penny. If your cost is sub penny then you, all your margins coming on the retail side of the product and the source, the input side, is wow. like all commodity inputs. 
is a razor thin margin farmer's game. And nobody's going to be there. So this is the thing. I'm now I'm looking at, you know, you're looking at this crazy valuations in yeah. all these stocks. You've got these these increasingly visible sources of uh, biosynthesized uh, cannabinoids. Yeah. And uh, reducing the cost of input to less than a penny per unit of input. This is why I think these stocks at one point are going to suddenly reverse, crash, and, and burn. 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 Burn, baby, burn. Burn, Disco burn, burn. The ring of fire. The ring of fire. The I ring of down, fire. Down, down, burn, down. Burn, burn. The went higher. Higher, higher. <laughs> They're going down. The ring of fire. Anyways. Well, uh, yeah, look, look, look. Like you, you could, there's some very smart people that think that. I mean, look, my, my only view is that usually. A, a stock is based some on some kind of stream of cash flow, right? Well, usually, usually except, outside except, of the Canadian universe. Yeah, except outside the Canadian well, speculative universe. Forget about like mining discoveries are an exception. Right. Oil discoveries are an exception. Technology but, discoveries. Yeah, that's why they usually when it just when a mine goes into production, that's usually when it peaks. Yep. Well, unless they buy another mine, and then it's a but then it's a play that's. Running on the balance sheet. Yeah. yeah. No, I hear you. Yeah. And so, so look. It, it, I mean, like that's why you know you can say you know, fundamentally they're they're expensive, they're expensive. When you look at the revenues, and ultimately that's what you have to do. I mean, in the dot com thing, it happened eventually, and and things got washed out before they rebuilt. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, the great companies kept going. Microsoft and a Amazon and Cisco. C Cisco didn't really do what Oracle. Oracle did okay. Oracle was the back end for all those uh, e-commerce plays. Yeah, they they made out like bandits. Well, Larry Ellison. Duh! Quite a story. Quite a story. You know, they they say very few people. In fact, he's he he, he comes from absolutely nothing. Hmm. You know, like he was uh, from dust till dust. You know, he's just one of these guys that was very good in mathematics, very smart. Huh. And and had unbelievable drive. I was never good at math. Well, subtraction, yes. Addition and multiplication, not so much. Subtraction? It's subtraction. You like that? Well, I mean, I can spend a dollar faster than you could say, Jack the Bear. Jack the Bear. See, I already spent five. <laughs> Just like that. Anyway, so uh, let's take a look at uh, what else yeah, we want to The markets look at are here. having a very terrible day today in the U.S. I can eh? feel it. Well, so the stock, the, the tech stock sell-off was what predicated the whole bad day across cannabis and everything. See, this is what I'm saying. Cannabis is now becoming like part of that tech sort of conglomerate. Yeah, yeah, if yeah, the techs yeah. have a bad day, oh, cannabis is going to sell off too. Do you think that's a direct relationship because Tilray's got privateer and privateer's got all those Silicon Valley guys? You, you, you know what? When, it's like, when, people, oh, get spooked, when people get spooked, it, it's like a domino thing, right? It's sort of... You know, goes from one domino to the next, like yeah, knocking, knocking them down, knocking them down, knocking yeah, them down. Yeah, I mean, if there's a lot of money in Tilray from Silicon Valley, and they're starting to get hurt in in uh, in their technology stocks, yeah, I could make sense to me. It, it it filters down. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. But uh, I think Facebook is one that's really getting it. Facebook. Let's take a look at Facebook here. Oh, and oh, ho, ho. yeah, that's that's very put up a one year chart of that. We might want to talk about that for a bit. One year chart of Facebook after that big sell off, you mean? Oh, let's go here. FB. You see, that, that thing got up to $218. What the hell is going on here? Yeah, now we just uh, oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. There we go. There's a big drop. What happened that day? Well, that, Thursday, that, July 26th. That the, was the day they got... Their earnings came out. Right. And and the, their earnings... Now, there's a couple of... No, no, that... Yeah, that was... There was the, a couple things. There was, a, there was something about... Oh, dear. I, 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 I really... Well, they, they, their earnings came out. They were terrible. But there was also something about 
they were going to be investigated by Congress yeah. for breach of privacy. That laws. might have been over here, I think. If I'm not mistaken, and then the earnings came out and they were bad, but then they tried to rally, but now look, now we've breached that low here. Yeah. That's not a good sign. Now, nope. Looks like it's going a lot farther lower, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, they've they've given up so much of their market capitalization. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, that's that's uh, well, that's a hundred and sixty dollars compared to two. Well, the problem is you look at the the peak. It's only one day, right? Yeah. Yes, indeed, Ed. Uh, okay, three fifty-five here. Let's see. Markets are getting ready to close. Yeah, let's take a look at let's take a look at uh, our favorite mining stocks. Uh oh. Let's start with GLDN, eh? GLDN. It. Uh, Golden Ridge Resources. Forty-four cents. We've been expecting news on this one. We haven't seen it yet, have we? No, we have not. If I was a if I was a gambling man, which I am, I would bet that the news is going to come out tomorrow. The way the stock's acting, could. It then the could. news looks like it could be good. Mike, maybe Mike Bleedy's going to send us into the long weekend with a smile on our face. <laughs> okay, just... let's take a look. We'll see how Sokoman did after our interview today. Up twenty. Up uh, or sorry, up. Five cents, twenty and a half. You could have bought that thing for fifteen cents. You'd be up thirty-two percent. Thirty-two percent. Just today. Day. Now, what's wrong with that program? Nothing at all. What's wrong with that program? Nothing at all. Who else do we like? Let's see what happened with Abin. Abin, I, I saw earlier had a nice day. Look at this, up four cents, up thirteen percent. Okay. No problem there. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. What about, what about uh, the, there was the one deal we were looking at yesterday? KBEV? Was it KBEV? Some. Kubwa. Kuboy. Kubaya. Kub <laughs> Kumbaya, no. Kubwa. <laughs> Umgawa. <laughs> Umgawa, muchacha. Jane. Yeah. Tell Chimp. Tell Chimp. Umgawa. <laughs> We're having trouble yeah. speaking today, aren't we, <laughs> Well, not, not, in, uh, not in Simeon language. No. Oof, oof. Mm. Oh, oh, oh. Where's Jane? Jane, ooh. <laughs> Send Jane. Cheetah. Oh. Ungawa. Ungawa. Okay, let's look at uh, what else we what else do we want to take a look at today, Ed? It's kind of been a uh, kind of been a. Okay, let's tell you what. I'm going to switch over here to the uh, to the cannabis. And let's see how organic. Switch over to the cannabis channel. Yeah, here we are. Okay, Namaste Technologies ended up, closed the day up 24 cents, 8.73, and we were just looking at that and it was, di it was up a penny. That just had a rally? Yeah, just at the no, end of the, the day. The, 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 all these are up now? Yeah. No. Serious? It's the end of day rally, Ed. No, that, that, that's impossible. Why is that impossible? It just happened before your very eyes. It was just... Okay. Was it N dot hyphen? Uh, Namaste? Yeah. N is the symbol. N hyphen? Hyphen? No, no colon. Colon. C A? No. It should be N colon. It should just be N. Or do you have to put in the Canadian designator? No. N colon C T S V. T S T X V? T S V. But, uh, yeah. Not bad. Not a bad little lift there. No, that's not it. Namaste announces exclusive. Okay, so here's their uh, here's their press release today. Namaste hey. announces it has signed a marketing and distribution agreement with Aero Brands to launch Air Aero Brands pre-filled vaporizer cartridge brand in both recreational and medical cannabis markets throughout Canada. Canada as part of the arrangement. Namaste will produce and distribute. Aero Brands pre-filled vaporizer cartridges through the company's wholly owned subsidiary and Health Canada's access to cannabis for medical purposes regulation licensed producer, Canmart. This agreement represents a strategic partnership between Namaste and Aero Brands to leverage Namaste's resources 
and Aero Brands Establish product. Through Infinite Labs, Namaste believes it has the capacity to become the go-to service provider to this high growth, high margin market of pre-filled cartridges. So there's what they're rocking and rolling on today. You know, Namaste got its start as a basically an online uh, supermarket for vaporizers and assorted accessories. Well, they certainly capitalized. So yeah, just out of curiosity, what uh, what when you put it in Namaste in on there, what do you put in? N. Just N. Yep. Okay. CSE companies on the move today. Let's take a look. Well, so Koyos Beverage dropped 17.59% uh, today. That was the one we were looking at yesterday, Ed. Yeah? Yeah, down 18%, call it, to 45 cents. Aviana Health Corporation. You know what? This Namaste was just down. It was just down. And here it is now over three bucks. It's flying right now. Holy smokes. Namaste? Yeah, it's over th it's 304 according to this. See? Look at that. Was there a, and you had, you, you, you doubted me. Tree of Knowledge International down uh, 10 cents today. Holy smokes. What's Tree of Knowledge International? I don't even know what they do. Let's take a look. Maybe nobody else knows what they do. That's why they're down 10. Oh, Tree of Knowledge, let's see defines its partnership with Dr. Sanjay Gupta. For the new CBD. Tree of, Tree of Knowledge for the new CBD technology. Tree of Knowledge International, formerly Cortland Capital Inc., wishes to clarify certain facts and any corresponding confusion caused by there being two prominent physicians with the name Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Oh, that's only, all, that's good. Only one of which is working with the company. Partnership with Dr. Gupta is centered on a new technology invented by Dr. Gupta that aims at a superior and faster delivery of CBD and cannabinoids to the brain. Aha, uh -huh, okay. He is a pain. Okay. It has come to the attention of TOK that an online publication mistakenly <laughs> used a photo of CNN correspondent Dr. Sanjay Gupta in public. <laughs> All right, so this is down basically. Toke. Uh, or rather, it is, yeah, down five cents because people thought that Dr. Sanjay Gupta from CNN was joining the company. Yeah, well, that was, when they put out his picture, it kind of, you know, confuses you. That would do it. Anyways, let's see who's having a good day. Look at that. Valens Grow Work is up another 19% today. That's a big move. Yeah, it is a big move. That's the second big move in a day. But look at their, let's take a look at their chart here. Look at that. How's that for vertical? So they had a uh, $4.50 uh, price target come out from Mackey Research Capital yesterday, which is obviously, so it's going to promptly head that way. But 215, boy, you could have bought that sucker. At a buck. Yeah. Wow. At a dollar. Let's see how our old friends at Chiron are doing today. K-H-R-N. Still waiting for the uh, buck 12. See? Just cannot get the traction. That's, uh, that's a little disappointing. They had their big, uh, their big tour, tour de force here with uh, Vicente Fox. But I don't think the message got across exactly as to the significance of that. Probably because they're poor choice of channels. Sure. But anyways, let's go back and look at some of these other. So overall, it's kind of a mixed day. Like, well, I got to tell you, I, the small cap thing, this. Everything just reversed. Because this was all red earlier. And now it's up slightly, like 0.39%, up 0.29%, up 0.34%. That's how volatile this day is. And then we got this, this one here. This is the big one, right? Yeah. So that's down 100 today. That's because the big ones are, wow, this, that's interesting. That, that, that really makes it confusing. <laughs> it does. When they go up and they go down, I know. Well, this is the interesting thing about the cannabis space. It's like, the it's volatility like, is unprecedented. Like, I mean, seriously, if you well, tried to watch yeah. this thing on a live chart, you'd, you'd, ha you'd have to go for neck surgery by the end of the day. 
because you'd be watching the thing snap back and forth, up, down, well, up, be, down, be, down, be, up, 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 yeah, up. You'd be ready to go to a tennis tournament, though. You'd, yeah, you'd be limbered up for tennis or ping pong, better yet. Okay, let's take a look Remember at our spell count. Tony Little used to do that, that funny uh, exercise thing. Uh, I just... It, <laughs> <laughs> Who's Tony Little? I don't know. He who was that a is. he was a very he promoted uh, uh, exercise equipment. He was a oh, bigger, yeah. really fit guy, long, long <laughs> hair, and he'd be sitting there and he'd do this thing. It was pretty funny. New strikes down four cents to seventy one. In med down four cents to seventy seven. Nutritional high. And yeah, see, it's all selling off on the small caps here, like on the really micro caps. Well, except yeah, okay. For the most part. Yeah. Friday night. Uh, you got a few in the green here. FSD. I can never make out what drives that stock because it's never associated with news. But today it's uh, it's back up. So <laughs> back up to 39 cents again. No, is, is ICC Labs, is that the one that's out of uh, Uruguay? Uruguay, yes. Is that the one? Yeah. ICC Labs. That, that's had a pretty good run here, I, I believe. Yeah, it's looking. Uh, let's just pull put up. up let's put up that little fella. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Buck sixty-five. Oh, it's it's sort of moving up in a in a uh, continuous incremental fashion. Yeah. Like it's up from a buck thirteen back in March April. But uh, Uruguay, yeah, that's a uh, that's an interesting location. But, uh, yeah, what else, Ed? Luxaria, still doing well. Zoe Medica, Chum Holdings, buck 21, no trades, or no change, rather. Suniva. Look at that, look at that uh, isodial. Isodial? Isodial is still ceased traded. Yeah, I was just saying it's static. Well, that's because it's ceased traded. Oh. <laughs> Do you know why it's these traded at? They're re restating their numbers. Is that what it is? I think so. Really? Yeah. How do you know? You know, I because they published that. I was wondering if Isa Dial's cease trade had anything to do with the fact that they paid a relative of a director twelve million dollar consulting fee. How did they come up with twelve? You think they'd just keep it multiples of five or something? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but six days cease traded now. That's not a good thing. Wow. And we still don't have a press release for them. Let's see if they put out any news here. Which one is which one are we looking at right there? Suniva. Suniva. So Suniva, I've been watching because I think they're going to have to announce a raise. Uh, Q two financials. Yeah. So. We know they've got big capex commitments and not much cap left. What time's uh, Mike coming on? Mike will be here in eight minutes. Is, is this a tape? No, Ed, it's live. Is it? <laughs> you know what this show is called? Here, see that? Midas letter live. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, moving right along. <laughs> Closing the book on that one. Uh, yeah. So what else we got in the what are what other movers? Let's take a look at the uh, <coughs> who the movers and shakers are Wrong. in the whole market. I'm going to pull up the uh, market movers today because we always like to have a look at that. Namaste is up there again. In there like a dirty shirt. Three oh five. Look at this. This thing flew. Sokoman closed up uh, six cents to twenty one and a half. Only up 40% or 39% today. Boy, should have bought more. Well, easy to say now. Yeah. Didn't look so easy yesterday, though, No. Did it? Well, it was, but I, I missed the market. Yeah. Supreme. Yeah. But uh, pretty much a light day everywhere. I mean, Namaste is the big winner of 13 million shares on the TSX Venture. Let's see on the CSE. Oh, I know who the big, the big hog is going to be on the CSE because it's always this huge pharma deal. Big hog? Anthony's. Yeah, 38 cents. 39 million shares traded. 
debut diamond. Yeah, not a lot of interesting developments. Valens Grow Works up on two and a half million shares. To yeah, why don't we rank the percentage change here on the on that? Can we? You can do that, can't you? Uh, it's not actually allowing me to do that with this in this view. Okay. So the answer there is no, 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 because it's ranked by volume by default because we're looking at the volume-based market movers. At least that's yeah, volume my, actives. Right. Okay. Let's 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 look at percentages. You get you got that one up there. Mm, nope. Click on that box right there next to volume. This one. Clicking no dice. So yeah, doesn't work in this view. But uh, let's see about, how about on the TSX? Oh, it's taking its time. Loading. Well, oh, Freya was the big trader on the TSX. It's 20 million shares, look closely the, followed by price, Aurora. It's almost up $3. You, know, uh, you almost wonder if something's going to be announced there tomorrow. From a Freya? Yeah. I don't know. Could be. Well, Canopy's twenty-one down. thirty-five. It's no longer a Freya. It's expensive. It's expensive. <laughs> Hexo, look at Hexo, seven ten. Whoa! Didn't you used to own that one? Yeah. Rub it in, Ed. Rub it in. <laughs> well, give me some rubbing alcohol. Yeah. That's how desperate I am. Canopy look at this. growth. I think Canopy's down two bucks. Our to friend, our friend John McMahon, I think, told me yesterday that the total value of the marijuana sector now is getting very close to the total value of all the mining companies. Like in terms all of all the mining companies in the world, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's talking about Canada marijuana companies to Canadian mining companies. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that probably makes more sense, right? I guess. Or yeah. ma maybe not. I, I don't know. I mean, I can't, the numbers are so mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Mike Gorenstein is here, Ed. Would you like to have a chat with Mike Gorenstein? Sure. He has some very interesting things today. Yeah. To say. Yeah. Today. Yeah. And here he is. Okay. Hey, welcome back. My guest in this segment is Mike Gorenstein, CEO of Kronos Group, trading on NASDAQ and the TSX under the symbol CRON. Mike, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for having me, uh, Mike. Let's just let's just get this one little piece of house cleaning out of the way. Um, you know, you, obviously Andrew left in the Citron research report is now, as demonstrated by the market, deemed uncredible. And the guy's choice of you know weaknesses to address were actually just more demonstrative of his inexperience in the cannabis industry more so than it was any any sort of smoking gun red flag um, but just in a in a single statement how was that whole experience for you uh, I'd say Kronos we we try to take the high road which is why we got into cannabis in the first place <laughs> so, I knew you were gonna come out with something like that Great. Recently, you announced a uh, partnership with Ginkgo Bioworks to produce cultured CBDs. Now, mm -hmm. I've been following a company that's producing cultured CBDs on the East Coast called Hyacinth that mm -hmm. does uh, uses genetically modified yeast to create the full range of CBDs and micro CBDs, including THCs. And mm -hmm. is this how is how is yours different from that, or how is it similar? Yeah, so I think this, the concept's similar, and it's actually not a, uh, you know, the concept of using yeast just as a generally a, a, a call it like a vector or a, a mechanism to create different different products is is very old. It's, it's insulin uh, is generally created that way, kombucha I and mean, beer, right? This is this is common. Uh, I think the difference, Hyacinth is a, it, it's always been a cannabinoid focused company. It's a startup that you know they had the idea that's what we're going to go after. Ginkgo is somewhat of a, a you know, different animal. It's they're they're the market leader in terms of DNA printing, and the way that they've approached this has been you know pretty large scale. So just for background, and you know when we looked at them, why we're like, okay, this is the partner for us. They raised 430 million USD to date. Uh, they've got over 100 PhDs there, and, and a lot of robots, as they say. But the early investors, and you know all the way up to where they are now. 
Bill Gates, Cascade, uh, Bayer, who we think knows a few things about, uh, you know, about agricultural and pharma, mm -hmm. uh, Viking Global, General Atlantic. We looked at their other partnerships and clients, and uh, also Bayer, there's a big relationship there. Uh, DARPA, which is the Advanced Research uh, Program for the U.S. Department of Defense. Right. Uh, Ajinomoto, Cargill, ADM, mm. uh, Robert A. And so th this wow. is a, a large company. What they're really doing, if you think overall about, like think of a website, and, it's, and you can take a website and white label it, or you can write it from scratch using HTML as code. Mm -hmm. What Ginkgo does is they look at the whole world and they say, well, you and I were just websites, and the code that's used is DNA. Right. So rather than just taking yeast and seeing can they do this, can they copy a pathway, they're actually overall doing genomic sequencing, figuring out what's the most efficient way to do this, and they are writing base pair by base pair, they're writing the DNA code to produce this efficiently. Wow, this so. sounds like rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it's science, it's, but look, that's, that's I think the disruption that, uh, right. you know, and what they did with the rose industry is what caught our attention. So if you look at the prices of roses and what's happened, you know, roses were very important for, uh, for fragrance. Right. You're extracting terpenes from these huge fields of roses, and they're grown in Ecuador, Colombia, uh, you know, as cheap as possible. And you're looking for that, that rare compound. It's very similar to cannabis, what you're doing. You're growing flour, and then you're looking to extract something. Mm -hmm. they, over, they went in, they sequenced the rose, they understood which fragrance matters. And since then, if you look at what's happened, you know, the client they have is now able to produce more consistently and in a much uh, more efficient clip, everything you need for fragrance. So has the bottom fallen out of the rose industry in Latin America? I would say an opportunity is open for Latin America to start cultivating cannabis. Uh, I see, okay, <laughs> great, great. Um, so if this technology is, is successful mm -hmm. and uh, it sounds like it's going to be if, the, if it's, it's got this level of investment in it, it sounds to me like Cannabis as an ingredient for things in like beverages, medicines, uh, even vapes is is not going to be derived from a plant in the future. It's going to be grown in a biological setting. Yeah, I mean, well, right now it's grown in a biological setting, right? It's just that what you're using is uh, is cannabis, uh, what we think of now, and to grow the cannabinoids, and this is just a more efficient way of doing it. Uh, but yeah, I think that's I think oh, that's right. The cannabis plant. That's right. You know, uh, but think about like, like think about what's happened in the U.S. If you look at some of the some of the vapes, mm. you know, it started off that the premium products, uh, the the big differentiator is how do you get the terpenes, and then people discovered, well, wait, we can get food grade terpenes uh, that are the same as cannabis. So you have a lemon haze. The reason that that lemon haze has the lemon scent and flavor is limonene. But the question is, do you have to get limonene from cannabis if it's also present in lemons? So the same thing happens, but. You know, that's the big reason we focused on putting up a big indoor facility uh, to have premium flour. You know, we do think that there is still some, some types of oils that will make sense to come from the plant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like fresh squeezed orange juice versus like orange juice and concentrate. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think that uh, this is, especially in the pharmaceutical area, but for anything where you need consistency and you're focusing on those discrete cannabinoids, that's where we see it going. Okay, so the obvious question is, is this that much cheaper a way to produce cannabinoids than is growing elaborate plants in elaborate greenhouses? Yeah, so the way, uh, there's a few things to look at. First, the, just the capex of putting up all these facilities from uh, cultivation extraction is very, very expensive, mm -hmm. especially if you need to do them all around the world. Right. Uh, but yeah, the way we structured the deal, our equity only is actually given, like their compensation, if they're able to produce at less than $1,000 per kilo of a pure cannabinoid. And that's for each cannabinoid. Hmm. So, uh, you know, to put that in perspective, if you're cultivating for a thousand a kilo for flour, you know, let's assume you can do it at 20% THC. So just off the bat, that puts you at 5,000 kilo. Right. Now let's go a step further. If you're extracting it, what's your cannabinoid yield? You know, there are companies that are aspiring to have 90% cannabinoid yield, right? So you're going to start getting up, you know, now getting higher to 6,000. Then, well, what's the cost of processing? 40 or 50 cents a gram or, you know, so, right. so you start getting up and you're looking at over 10,000 a kilo, you know, aspirationally. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think it's a fraction. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a minimum floor. That's a level where they're willing to, to say, we won't even take compensation if we can't do it below that. That's not the target. Wow. So that implies then that this, uh, this massive build out of cannabis cultivation capacity is really already overdone. If this is the way that we're going to 
obtain all of mm -hmm. the ingredients X of the premium uh, flower smoking experience I mean how big is that market going to be as a percentage of the whole you know I, I think they're both huge markets I think there are the applications will be bigger but you know the idea that all of the infrastructure that we're seeing going up was going to actually work you know if you weren't able to if you had infrastructure for say a, a tomato or a, a, you know cultivating cucumbers and it was wasn't enough to stay alive there retrofitting it for cannabis which is going to be just as competitive you know I, I don't think it works uh, but I'd say yeah you could ask the same question and a lot of people thought like how would a blockbuster store ever be you know unnecessary overbuild or irrelevant uh, this idea of Netflix makes no sense right yeah. okay so then um, you've also announced that you're rolling out in uh, Latin America through mm -hmm. an affiliate Agrodia, Agrodia SAS mm -hmm. Colombia's leading agricultural services provider yeah so what what is that uh, what does that all start with 207 acres starting mm -hmm. and you're gonna be growing outdoors there no, we'll, so we'll still, it's, uh, it, we're using greenhouses. Mm -hmm. uh, th these guys are extremely experienced. They've been working on for quite a while. They actually, uh, a lot of the infrastructure came. They, when you, when you think of cannabis companies now saying, you know, we want to get out of the cultivation business, right, that happened with Dole as well, where mm -hmm. Dole sold off their productive assets for flowers, and these guys purchased the, the infrastructure from Dole. Okay. So they already have a very large operation going, and, and you know, it's sort of all central. They have the tissue culture, microprop lab, all these different services. So we're leveraging that, but we'll still use greenhouses. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the idea. So for flower-based global export, that's what we see as the best platform, I think, in terms of climate, uh, in terms of expertise, in terms of labor costs. Uh, you know, we think that, that Columbia makes a ton of sense, and we think we have the right partners. Sure. Um, I want to ask your opinion about something that's happening in the marketplace because mm -hmm. you're the other company on NASDAQ mm -hmm. now is uh, Tilray has uh, achieved this at, uh, absolutely stellar valuation mm -hmm. on what appears to me to be uh, a subset of what more mature companies in the space have in terms of operational footprint. Um, is, is it your experience that the retail appetite for stocks in the cannabis space on NASDAQ are going to be subject to intensive accumulation by the retail side at this point as is evidenced by what's going on in, uh, in Tilray right now and I'm assuming that despite an absence of credibility and effect in the Citron research piece that it still had an effect we saw that mm -hmm. for a day or two and I, I I'm assuming it's just a matter of a short period of time till the momentum comes back and everybody says okay that mm -hmm. was a nothing let's accumulate sure Kronos I think there's a lot more going on I think first you know given what we're talking about and if you think about what companies you know overall whether it's strategics or whether it's large institutional investors what they really place value on you know I think the retail market thinks so much about what's your funded capacity we've always kind of joked about this mm -hmm. but Institutional investors, strategics, they're always asking, well, isn't the compression going to come on the cultivation side? Does it really matter? So that's not really where most of the value is placed. And, you know, there was, uh, I think it was Bloomberg uh, that a few months ago did an article to break down percentage of institutional investment. And we were on the NASDAQ. We had the highest, I think the second highest. And I assume certainly now post-consolation, it's, it's going to be canopy. They were, you know, the second highest there. They're on the NICE. I think a lot of it is you're seeing institutional money come in. There certainly is still retail, but that percentage is, uh, is I think, changing. Uh, and I think they value different things. The other part, and this is you know, coincidental, the two companies listed on NASDAQ, we also have sort of, over the last few years, made sure that you know, to answer the question, what are you going to do about the U.S.? We've, we've had solutions that are fully legal, fully compliant, that we've started setting up, uh, I think, longer than any of the other you know, major LPs this whole infrastructure in the U.S. is ready for us. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another factor that goes in when, when investors are looking, how are you getting into the largest consumer market? What is your plan of attack? Have you thought this through? How are you going to take your IP that you're, you're telling us is scalable and you're working on? How do you move to the other markets? What are you doing globally? So I think it's a much different approach of, uh, of looking at the company, what you're, what you're after, rather than just saying, you know, how many kilos can you produce and what's the cost of producing the kilos? Uh, there are very few companies in the world I've ever heard of valued that way outside of this industry. Right. Huh. Okay. So what's the uh, what's the big catalyst in the in the near term for Kronos Group going out, say six, twelve, twenty-four months? 
You always ask this, and I always, uh, <laughs> usually not what you'll, what you'll expect, maybe it will be what you expect, I never know what the expectations are, but it could be anything from us going and, uh, you know, sequencing DNA and figuring out a way to produce cannabinoids to other disruptive technology, there's entering new product categories, you know, we look at it as, as not what's the catalyst in six months, 12 months, 24 months, but what is it that sets us up the best mm -hmm. for five years when you're, when you're looking out and you're saying, okay, you know, what is this company worth on bottom line and with a, with a relevant multiple? That's really where we're focused and we always have been. Okay, and that's yeah. still the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Mike, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, thanks very much for the update. All right. New visits. What's that going to cost you? 2500 or some fucking stupid thing. Hey, wow. thanks for that, Mike. What do you think? Mike. Mike. Mike who? Gorenstein. Oh. Mike who, boy. Are they talking about to the, <laughs> this, talking this is to live, Ed. <laughs> Mike who? Mike <laughs> Raffone. You don't know Mike Raffone? Mike Raffone was a good friend of mine. Mike Raffone, is that to, Italian? Mike Raffone would listen to everything I said. Really? <laughs> and sort of broadcast it a bit? Yeah, and then tell everybody. Wow. No, I know. It's just amazing. Mike Raffone. Mike Raffone. Italian guy. That was like when uh, they had that, that show and, uh, you know, the big guy uh, from New York. The guy was in Taxi. Lottie Dottie, Free John Gotti, he, King who, of New York. You no, know, who, who was the great actor that played in Taxi Driver? Uh, taxi Driver, Al Pacino. No, not... not <laughs> nice try. The film? No, not Taxi. That was... Uh, no, the other big guy. Not Taxi the Driver. Other remember, big guy? remember, what's her name? Boy, <laughs> I'm going to need a little taxi bit more than driver. smoke symbols. The TV show? No. Robert De Niro. Robert, Robert De, De Niro. Oh, right. Al Pacino. Okay. Thank you very much from the control room. <laughs> See, this is what he, I love about senility. Yeah. Yeah. Al Pacino. So well, I get so, those guys so confused a lot. Robert De Niro played the devil in a movie once, and is, you know what his name was? Who? Lou Cipher. Lou Cipher. I like that. Lou he played the, dif the devil. Says, what's your name? Lou. Lou what? Uh... And they, they didn't know they were talking to the devil, and he was sitting there, and he was sitting in a big chair, and he had like a, a, a big gold uh, cane, you know, and he was sort of acting extremely like he ruled the world. Yeah. And he says, what's your name? Lou. Lou what? Lou Cipher. Right. Lou Cipher. So that's it. sort of like Mike Graffone. When will, here's a Cameron Merced is asking, when will Vic Neufeld be on the show again? Well, the way it's going right now. We think maybe tomorrow. Vic, can you come on the show tomorrow? What are you doing tomorrow, Vic? Come on over. Come on and say hello to us here. Yeah, in something the, it's you, interesting you that I saw, just saw him get on an elevator. I know. You were seen in the building. Uh, uh, that stock put a on. A question here from uh, La, Rob Law. La, La, Rob Law. La, La, Rob oh, La. is that related to the Law Law chain? That's Bob Law Law. <laughs> His question is, what do you think will happen October 17th regarding the cannabis stock market? Will be there a higher top compared to last year's autumn and winter? Well, compared to last year's autumn and winter, that's easy. Yes, there will be a much higher top. Well, uh, wait, wait a minute. We don't know that. I guess there would be. Well, I mean, the one great value catalyst that in the timeline that is a known definite date written in stone is October 17th. Interestingly enough, the, re the viewers should remember that there's a lot more uh, issuers out there now in the space than there was, say, nine months ago. Krim El Fouli corrects you that the movie that Robert De Niro played, the, or Al Pacino played the devil in, was Devil's Advocate. No, no, I, that, that's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about the movie that, that uh, De, Niro. De Niro played the devil. De Niro played the devil. Yeah, and I can't remember what it was. It was you, you Google Google where what role did De Niro play the devil, and you'll get an answer. Okay. No, but I, another question the from the what do you viewer. think of Organogram? Let's get back to the movie thing for a Okay. <laughs> I just want to say, no, I I know that Devil's Advocate was a great movie with Al Pacino, especially the scene in the subway. Okay, so which one remember was that it one? that De Niro played a devil? I don't remember, but I know he played. I say, what m movie did De Niro play Lou Cipher? All right, I'm going to Google that. 
What film did, did De Niro play? De Niro Lou play Cipher. Lou Cipher. Angel Heart. That's it. <laughs> there you are cracking him up in the in the control know, room. Angel Heart. I don't even know what it was about, but no, me either. They said, "What's your name?" He said, "Lou." Lou what? Lou Cipher. And they see. Hmm. <laughs> I didn't know there was a devil. Yeah, there is the de the devils in the details. Uh, anyways, Ed. So it's four twenty. Do we have a product of the day? Mm. No, but guess what? We're going to start rolling out Midas Letter Cannabis Swag. I think we should bring out some t-shirts. I think we should bring out some t-shirts and some hoodies. T-shirts, hoodies, and very interesting... Vapes? Eye eyewear. Goggles. Sunglasses. Welding masks. Or a fly mask, like or, the horses or, wear. Or uh, what, what are those? And, and maybe we should start bring out a brand. What's that instrument called from Scotland? The, the bagpipes. Anyways, that brings us to an end of our show again today, everybody. So thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to sign up and say hello and click on this and click on that and sign up for the newsletter. Well, we, we, something seems to be going on with Afria. Uh-oh. Ed is predicting tomorrow, kaboom. Something, well, kaboom. Kaboom. Anyway. Anyway, that's all for today. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, folks.